Welcome to this video on orientation responses. So orientation responses means the response of plants and the response of animals to a stimulus. And in this case, a stimulus could be any one of four things. That's gravity, light, chemicals, and touch. And for each of these four things, you're going to need to learn the biological term for it. So there's what we call a prefix, which we'll be using. So for gravity, we're going to use the word geo to describe it. For light, we're going to use the word photo. For chemical, the word chemo. And for touch, it's thigmo. And gravity, light, chemicals, and touch can all affect how plants and animals respond. So if we look at plants, for example, they can have what's called a directional response, which we're going to call a tropism, to some kind of stimulus. So for example, plant roots grow with gravity. They go in the same direction. So that's called a directional response of a plant. And we're going to call that a tropism. The other term for a plant is what's called a non-directional response. So the plant still responds to some stimulus, for example, touch, but it doesn't do it in a direction. So when a Venus flytrap closes over a fly, it doesn't matter whether it's towards or away from the fly, no matter what happens when it gets touched, it closes in the same direction. So that's what's called a non-directional response, and we're calling that a nasty or a nastic response. Whereas when we look at animals, we can have also the directional response, but because it's animals, we call it a taxic response or a taxis. And this is a directional response to some kind of stimulus. So for example, when you turn on the light, the worm burrows down into the ground to avoid the light. That's a directional response away from the light. Whereas animals can have non-directional responses as well. For example, if you turn on a light with slaters, they don't go towards or away from the light. They just run around like crazy. So in this video, we're going to combine those four different types of stimulus, the light, gravity, touch, and chemicals, with these four different types of directional and non-directional responses for plants and animals. We're going to look at examples and how to name them and the key information that you'll need to know. So let's delve into some depth now. On this left-hand table is everything you need to know. Here are the four different stimuluses we could get, which has the prefix or the names of what we're going to call them. And there's the four different types of responses we can get. The two for plants, the directional one of a tropism, and the non-directional one of a nasty or a nastic response. And the two for animals, taxis, which is the directional response of animals, and kinesis, the non-directional response. So let's delve now into tropism. So a tropism is the turning of an organism, so it's a plant now, that's what we're talking about, towards or away from a stimulus. So it has to be directional. So for example, if you have this plant here and it's laid on its side in the very early stages. Down the left you've got the roots, at the top you've got the early little shoots. What's going to happen is the roots will start to grow downwards down the bottom here and the shoots will start to grow upwards near the top here. But why does that happen? It happens because in the roots the cells actually shorten, their growth gets inhibited and if anything gets smaller and shortens it bends closer together. So if you try and touch the top of your palm to the bottom of your palm, it's going to bend your whole hand down together. Same thing happens in the plant roots, whereas the opposite thing happens in the shoot. For example, the cells on this bottom side actually lengthen, and so the whole shoot gets pushed upwards. But plants aren't that smart, so how do they actually know to do this? And it's all because of this chemical called auxin. So this hormone, if you will, gathers in the lower half of the stem, and that's what caused the cell roots to actually shorten that chemical. If it's a cell root and you see auxin, it shortens or it slows its growth. Whereas if you're in a shoot, it speeds up its growth and that lengthens the actual cells you see here. So that's how the roots will go downwards and the shoots will go upwards. So that's what's actually going on in the early stages of a plant. Now let's look at how that's a response to a stimulus. So if we look at the roots, for example, so this is one big response to gravity primarily. Oxen gathers in the lower half of the stem, so it's using gravity to go right down to the bottom. And then, if you look at just the roots, in the lower half of the stem, it's causing the roots to go in the same direction as gravity. So when we're naming it, we go and look at the stimulus, which is gravity, so we call that geo. And this is a directional response, it's the same direction as gravity, so it's going to go downwards. So we can call that geotropism. And when we look at the shoots, we can see the same kind of thing. It's a response to gravity. It's growing away from gravity now. And so it's also called a geotropism, directional response to gravity. So we can label that one as well. But you'll notice that the roots are going downwards and the shoots are going upwards. They're opposite responses. So we need to label these as positive and negative. Now, positive means in the same direction as the stimulus, towards the stimulus. And in this case, gravity is going downwards. Gravity always goes downwards. So we can call it in the roots, positive geotropism, because it's going in the same direction as gravity. 
Whereas with the shoots, we can call it negative geotropism because it's going against gravity, it's growing upwards. So that's the role that auxin plays in early plants just as they germinate when they're very young and causes the roots to grow downwards with positive geotropism and the shoots to grow upwards with negative geotropism. Now plants actually have the same kind of response to sunlight, so shoots will grow towards the sunlight whereas roots will grow away from the sunlight. We're going to look at that one next. But first, there's a benefit to everything that we need to learn and you're going to need to articulate this in your exam if you want to get merit and excellence level answers. So the benefit to geotropism in plants is that the roots can grow really, really deep down and get fertile soil and growth. And we're going to look at the advantages of shoots in just a moment. So now when we see these shoots, imagine this is the end of a plant stem. It's just starting to grow upwards. And what happens is the sun shines down on the end of this plant shoot. And plants have these what's called photoreceptors, which means light receptors in their tips. So they receive this kind of light, and this causes auxin to be released, or sometimes called IAA molecules, same kind of thing. And you might hear this term called the meristem. So the meristem is just the growth tissue, or the growing part of a plant. So when a plant's growing along, it sees the sunlight, in that part of it, that growth part, it releases that same chemical auxin, or otherwise known as IAA. Then what happens is the sunlight causes that auxin to go on the opposite side of the plant, so it all goes away from the sunlight, and then that auxin causes the cells to elongate. All of this means that this plant that's growing will end up growing towards the light. And that's how plants shoots when they're growing up, no matter how old the plant is, will be growing towards the light. And the opposite thing happens in plant roots. If there's ever a germinating plant with little roots poking out, they're going to go away from the light if they can help it. So if we wanted to name this, we'd look at this as a response to light, so we'd say it's photo, and it's a directional response to light because it's going towards the light. So that's a tropism. So we can call this phototropism. But remember, directional responses are always positive or negative, so we can call this one a positive phototropism because it's growing towards the light. And just previously, we looked at the benefits of roots because they can grow really deep and find the water and nutrients for the plant. But the benefit for shoots is that they can grow upwards towards the light for better photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is how they make all of their energy. So it means they can get better energy. And in the same kind of thread, if you're looking at a competitive advantage, this means that they can avoid the shade that other plants might produce on them, which means they can't do photosynthesis so easily. And finally, they might get more exposure to pollinators. If you have flowers and you're going to put them right out there near the top in the sunlight, it's going to be more likely that bees and other pollinators will see them, so you're going to spread and reproduce more easily. So those are the advantages of shoots growing upwards towards the sunlight or towards the light in a positive phototropic response. Now you might be asking yourself, how the heck do people know that all of this stuff goes on inside plants? Well, they did a very simple experiment that proves it. On the end of the plant shoot, they put a thimble, something which stopped the photoreceptors receiving any light. So effectively, you've blinded the plant. And when they do this, you don't get any auxin released in the meristems, so you don't get auxin moving away from sunlight over here, which means you don't get elongation in the cell. So no positive phototropism exists. Or because we've blinded this plant over here with a thimble sitting on top of those growth stems, or on the meristems. So we've covered a lot of details with plant, but let's cover the key points right now. So for shoots, the plants growing upwards, we had a positive phototropic response, or positive phototropism, which means the shoot grow towards the sunlight, or towards the light. They also had a negative geotropic response, which meant the shoots grow away from gravity. And on the other end of the plant, we looked at roots. So they showed positive geotropism, which meant they grew in the same direction as gravity. They also showed negative phototropism, which meant they wanted to grow away from the light. So we've done tropism in a lot of detail now when looking at plants. And you can also see that when naming them, you're going to join together the name of the stimulus, geo, photo, chemo, or thigmo, with the directional response or the non-directional response, in this case, tropism, when you're getting the name. And don't forget, if it's directional, you're always going to have either a positive or a negative at the start of this name. So now let's move on and look at nastic responses. So a nastic response is a non-directional response of a plant to some kind of stimulus, which means we're not going to have a positive or negative direction there. So let's look at some examples. Here we have a flower that's open during the day, but when it's nighttime, the flower closes all up. So this is a non-directional response to the light that goes on. So if we want to name that, we can join together the response type, which is photo because it's responding to light, and a non-directional response, which is nasty. And put all that together in a name, so we can call it photo nasty. 
Now, in this case, remember, there's no positive or negative because there's no direction. There's no towards or away from. It's a non-directional response. Now, the assumed benefit of actually closing up the flowers at night is that it keeps the pollen dry for pollinators. If you leave it open in the night, the dew that forms overnight will make the pollen all wet, so pollinators can't come, take it away, and it's harder for the plant to reproduce. So that's what people think the benefit is of closing up these flowers. But there is a little bit of uncertainty around these things. Another response is that a fly might land on a Venus flytrap. When the fly touches the Venus flytrap, it closes and the fly is trapped. Then the Venus flytrap eats it up and that carries on with life. So this is a non-directional response to touch. So if we look at the start for touch, the stimulus, it's called thigmo. And a non-directional response is nasty. So we call this thigmo nasty. And again, no positive and no negative because it's non-directional. So the benefit for the Venus flytrap is that it's just a good source of food for energy to do this. But it's not the only plant that responds to touch. There's also the mimosa plant. And if you touch this, it closes up. So if you touch on the end of that mimosa plant, you're going to see that all the leaves closing up really tightly. Now, this is a non-directional response to touch. So again, we want to look at touch, which is thigmo, and non-directional, which is nasty. And we can call it thigmo nasty. And the benefit of this one is that if a leaf-eating insect lands on the leaves, they close themselves right up and it's much harder to get eaten. So these are nastic responses, so non-directional responses of plants. Now let's move on to animals. In animals, we have the directional response, which is called a taxic response. This is any movement of an organism, so an animal, towards or away from some kind of stimulus. So let's look at examples now. So first of all, we have a worm. If you turn on the light next to the worm, it's going to burrow right into the ground and try to get away. So this is a directional response to the light. So if we're talking light, that means we're going photo. If it's directional with an animal, we're talking taxis, so it's phototaxis. And it's trying to get away from the light, so that's negative phototaxis because it's moving away. Now the benefit for the worm in this case is it's more likely to actually survive in those cold, dark environments. If they're out, birds are going to eat them, other predators are going to stand on them. It's not a very likely place for them to survive. Or another type of response is from slaters. If you touch a slater, it's going to run away from the touch and try and hide. So this is a negative response. So this is also directional response to touch. So if we look at touch, that's thigmo. And a directional response is taxis. So we can call that thigmo taxis. And we're keeping that as negative thigmo taxis because it's running away from us. Now, just like the worm, the benefit is they want to move as fast as possible away from their predators. So something different now. If you have a male moth, they follow the pheromone trail that gets laid by this female moth. They follow it along. So this is a directional response to chemicals this time. Pheromones are chemical responses. So if we look in our table, chemical is chemo, a directional response because it's following it in the same direction as taxis. So we can call this chemotaxis. Now it's following it in the same direction of the chemical. So we call this positive chemotaxis. And the benefit for moths is that they're more likely to reproduce if the males can actually find the females to do it. Now, if we look at sperm and eggs, for example, they follow chemicals laid out by eggs. So in the same kind of way, this is a directional response to a chemical. So we can call that chemo for chemical and taxis for a directional animal-like response. So that's chemotaxis. And because they're going in the same direction, it's also positive chemotaxis. And in humans, it makes it more likely for reproduction to occur and actually offspring to happen and the human race to survive. So these are all different examples of the taxic response or taxis response that we're looking at. Now let's look at kinesis. This is the non-directional response of an animal to some kind of stimulus. So for example, we get slaters, we turn on the light like we mentioned at the start of this video, and they're going to run around like crazy in no particular direction. It's a non-directional response to light. So we can call that photo for light and kinesis, non-directional, photokinesis. And we don't need a positive or negative because it's non-directional. And again, with light, they just don't want anyone to see them, so they can run in any direction to try and hide under something. So that's the benefit for these slaters, really wanting to hide from predators. Now, if you look at the flatworm, which floats along here, if you turn on the light, they just start turning around in 90 degree angles, not necessarily towards or away from the light, they just turn at 90 degrees all the time. So this is a non-directional response to light as well. So we call that photo for the light, and kinesis, a non-directional response, so photokinesis. Now again, no positive and no negative response. And the benefit for them is the same. They want to hide from predators when the light goes on. Now they might find a rock closer or further away from the light. It doesn't matter. They just want to find somewhere to hide pretty quickly.
So we've now covered a lot of examples of different stimuluses that create directional and non-directional responses in plants and animals. We've looked at what the benefits are likely to be, we've delved right into detail for plants and how it happens, and most importantly, how to name these responses in our exams. So let's summarize now what we need to know. We learned that there are four different types of stimuluses that we're going to look at. The first is gravity, the second is light, the fourth is chemical, and the fifth is touch. And you're going to need to learn the prefixes for each of these single ones. So that's geo for gravity, photo for light, chemo for chemical, and thigmo for touch. We also learned that there are four types of responses to every single one of these stimuluses. The first is a tropism. That's a directional response of a plant, and that can be positive or negative. We then learned about nastic responses, which has the ending nasty. Now, this is a non-directional response to a plant. It happens in no particular direction, so there's no positive and negative. Then when looking at animals, we learned about taxic responses or taxis. This is a directional animal response, so towards or away from that stimulus, versus kinesis, which is non-directional animal responses to that same kind of stimulus we might see. So those are the important take-home message, and always remember that if you're doing a directional response of tropisms for plants or taxis for animals, you're going to need to do positive for towards that stimulus and negative for away from that stimulus, and you put that in front of the name. So this is everything you need to know from the video, and you've looked at all the examples. So let's look at a question now. In this one, we have a certain type of bean seed. And when it germinates, this combination of factors make sure that the shoots grow upwards and the roots grow downwards, regardless of which way you plant the seed. You could put the seed in upside down. In fact, you probably have no idea which way it is, but it still grows in the right direction. So we need to talk about the roles of light and gravity and oxen, that plant chemical, in the growth of a shoot. And we'll talk about the roots as well because it mentioned them. Right from that early stage of germination into when it fully grows into a mature plant. So we're going to look at four different factors when we do that. So let's look at the first one first. So here we have to describe the response of the shoots and the roots within the environment as it germinates and as it grows. So if you remember when we looked at a shoot and we lay it on its side, oxen gathers down the bottom and the cells shorten to make the roots grow downwards and they lengthen on the shoots to make the shoots grow upwards. And when we want to explain any of this in our answers, we label that as negative geotropism. So when we write this down, we can say the shoot is negatively geotropic or shows negative geotropism. This means that it grows upwards regardless of the direction of where it was pointing when it emerged from the seed. It's always going to go against gravity. Whereas when we look at the roots, we see positive geotropism, which means after the emergence, they grow down towards gravity. So in the same direction as that. And we can call that positive geotropism or a positively geotropic response. And just to jump on to the second part of that question, it says describe the role of oxen. So we can say that oxen actually gathers on the underside of the cell, then it causes these root cells to shorten down in the roots so that they'll grow downwards, whereas it causes the shoot cells to elongate, so that points the shoot upwards. And again, we can write this down. It just says oxen works by gathering in the lower half of the stem. That's where gravity comes into play. In roots, the oxen shortens these parts of the cells, so that bends the roots downwards, whereas in stems, oxen lengthens the cells on the underside, and that bends the root to point upwards. So the next part of the question asks us to link the effect of gravity and light with the action of oxes through the different stages of shoot growth. We've looked at just germination and the very early stage, but what happens when these shoots get a little bit older? Now we learned about that with phototropism, the plant's response to light. So we learned that in the early stages, the shoots display positive phototropism, they move towards the light, whereas roots display negative phototropism, which goes away from the light. But more importantly, when you go to the later stage, you're going to get sunlight, which happens. It's going to hit the photoreceptors or the light receptors on the mirror stems, that's the growth tissue of the plants or the growing stems, and then oxen gets released. Now, sometimes you'll see that as being called IAA molecules as well. So we can write this down and say that photoreceptors are located on the shoot tips of plants. And then when the sunlight hits the photoreceptors, a hormone called oxin, or sometimes called IAA, it's produced in the mirror stem. And if you want to define meristems, you can say it's the growth tissue of plants. But we haven't explained everything yet. We then can say that the sunlight causes the oxen to move away from the light. And when that happens, the oxen causes the cells to elongate and grow more quickly. So therefore, the plant shoot will grow towards the light. So we could say exactly this in a sentence. Sunlight causes oxen to move to the side away from the sunlight, then stimulates the cell elongation. So the shoot will bend towards the light. So that's how you'd explain that next stage. And finally, if you really want to nail your excellence, you need to discuss the benefits or advantages that the shoots gain from these responses. 
So there are three main benefits that we covered. The first is the plant grows upwards towards the highest intensity of light. Plants need light to survive for photosynthesis. That's how they create their energy. So if you're growing towards lots of light, you'll be able to create lots of energy. The second thing was that they avoid shading by those competing plants. So they're not going to get their light blocked out. If they grow right up towards the light, they're going to get out of the shade and be able to do more photosynthesis. And the final thing was that if they grow upwards, it also exposes them to pollinators. So there's going to be birds and bugs and bees all trying to pollinate them, which increases their chance of reproductive success. So those are the benefits of why shoots grow upwards in response to light. And this is how you do orientation responses.